So how did this happen? Well, this is going to be kind of like a list or tips about how to make YouTube a job that you can enjoy if you're interested in making videos. And number two, how I did it. Now this is no success story. This is still a learning process. I'd say I'm about 10% there. I'm not even close. But I do think that I do make content that does reach a pretty, pretty broad audience out there. And I think a lot of people enjoy it. Also, a lot of people hate it. But let me tell you how I got there. Number one is ditch the phone. Yeah, yeah, you hear the likes of Casey Neistat, you know, film masters out there that say, the story is more important than how you film it or what you film it on. But I've had some pretty amazing stories, like when I drove my car across southern China randomly in the middle of nowhere, ended up in towns of hitmen and uh, going off-road in rural Guizhou where we were getting chased by people. Now, all of these crazy stories that happened were kind of semi-documented on really, really poor cameras. And yes, it was a good story, but would you want to see it like this? Guys, you won't believe what just happened to us on the road. Oh my God. So there were these, uh, these hitmen and they were in this cabin and we had to like jump out the window and it was so crazy. You have no idea how much danger we're in right now. Oh shit, hold on, I'll see you next time. Hold on, gotta go. The whole ca camera phone fiasco. I've had a lot of different cameras since then. Most of them kind of point and shoot like quick, quick and dirty little cameras. And yeah, the quality definitely went up. I was using a handy cam for a while, but when I finally decided to kind of suck it up and get a big boy camera, and again, the thing I'm filming on right now, the A6300 is not a, like a massive film camera. It doesn't cost that much money, but it is not user friendly and it forced me to kind of learn everything. White balance, ISO, uh, color, color grading, color profiles, uh, different lenses, f-stop, all this kind of stuff, audio that goes into, you know, making a decent looking video or de decent sounding video at least because audio is definitely more important than video, trust me. All of this stuff really meant that when I first bought this camera, I'd, I can safely say the videos that I was shooting with it looked worse than the videos that I had been shooting before on like lower hardware. So it kind of forced me to start to learn how to use a camera. And that's the first step of making video, right? As a, as a career, making videos on YouTube to try to make money or you know get a bigger following is you have to learn how to use a decent camera. And that's kind of what made it happen. It was difficult, but I had to spend a lot of time with people that knew what they were doing. So I would meticulously watch people like uh, my friend Charlie or Winston or uh, Rick and Mark, watch what they were doing, ask questions, put yourself in a lower status because you are absolutely a pleb when it comes to these really, really difficult cameras and getting shots and how to compose them and put them together. So it's kind of like, I would say my piece of advice was to ditch anything that's user friendly because you have a limitation. You have a, like a, how to say, it's like a peak. You're going to reach a peak and eventually you can't do too much more with that, right? But if you get something like an entry-level mirrorless camera or a DSLR, even a D70 or something, then you're putting yourself in a situation that's going to force yourself to use more of the camera. And in the end, if you stick with it, your product's going to look much, much, much better. And that's why I'm getting into more difficult things now, like uh, color grading and color profiles and LUTs and all this kind of stuff. Number two, it's not about me. Now vlogging is tricky. Vlogging is basically putting yourself on camera and this first person perspective kind of lends itself to being not self-absorbed, but you're looking at yourself while you film yourself and talk about your life. Kind of assuming that people out there care and before you have a subscriber base, that can be pretty, uh, pretty worrying because if you don't get the response then you kind of look like this tool walking around to the camera, right? If people are genuinely invested in your life, then it's a different story. You get that feedback, you know what to shoot, you know what to say. But vlogging in general has its limitations because okay, you lead an interesting life, right? The problem is, is if you don't cover topics outside of your sphere of influence, if you don't cover your topics that can kind of reach a different audience outside of your core subscriber following, then you're gonna be stuck in a limbo because you'll just retain that original kind of core following that liked you from the beginning. Now it's important not to alienate that, those people because those original subscribers are what you build off of basically, right? They're probably the most dear to you. They probably know all the most nitty gritty details about you, but unless you start covering topics that other people might be interested in, then your channel's not gonna go anywhere. And I'll give you an example. If I make a video called, uh, I'm walking around the streets of Changsha Hunan, right? Now, I literally just alienated about 90% of people because who knows what Changsha Hunan is? It's a huge city with like 10 million people. But most people outside of China aren't gonna know what that is. And because in China, YouTube is blocked, most of your viewers are gonna be, you know, elsewhere in the world, probably in the West. So my personal example would be if I made a video called walking around the streets of Changsha Hunan, no one's gonna watch that except for the people that already know what that is or are really personally invested in me. However, if I do a video about walking through the streets of Changsha Hunan, 
maybe I title it or make the content how China has changed in the past eight years that I've lived here. Now people have a lens. Everyone knows what China is and maybe people are interested to see someone's life in China. They're already kind of now, if they see the thumbnail and the title, they say, oh, I'm interested in seeing that. That looks really, really cool. You don't have to mention these kind of details that aren't going to hit other people, right? So topical videos really, really made my channel take off because yes, I could insert or inject pieces of my life into them. It is my video. It's my uh, product. It's my production. But I didn't have to lose my own personal flavor or kind of how I do things because in addition to talking about my life and sharing my family's life and all the interesting things that happened to me, I was able to put a lens on it and cover topics that might bring other people in that otherwise wouldn't be interested in a channel about what I do. And like I said, that contributed massively this year to this huge, huge growth was when I started to step outside my comfort zone and try to cover things that would uh, maybe help people or teach people about something because it feel, felt like a waste to live in China for eight years and then not cover topics that covered a bigger viewer base. Number three is learn how to edit your video, learn how to make a slick product because I kid you not for the, I hate to say this, this is, this is damning stuff, but in the beginning of my channel, I'm not gonna say beginning, I'd say for the majority of my channel's duration, I was using Windows Movie Maker to put together a video. And let me tell you the limitations. So Windows Movie Maker has one timeline. So if I wanna put a clip on top of another clip, so I say, hey, check out this Coke bottle, right? And then I wanna put the clip of the Coke bottle on top of it, like I can do right now. I couldn't do that because you can't put clips on top of each other. So I was playing off of one timeline. So you get a shot and then you cut to the next shot and you cut to the next shot. And if you wanna show something, you move the camera here and cut that shot into it. It was like the most limiting software, but that's what I'm trying to talk about was actually that's what limited how crappy and terrible my videos were was because of the software I was using and the camera I was using. So the software is not powerful enough to be able to learn how to compose a decent looking video. So meanwhile, I was watching other channels out there on YouTube. Again, I always say Serpent ZA because we were always hanging out and stuff like this, but I would watch his channel and he would make the jump and start learning Adobe Premiere. And the, the learning curve was massive. It's super, super hard to use Adobe. And for the longest time, I was like, nah, I'm not gonna use that. Let me see if there's any other more user-friendly softwares out there. And my videos looked like absolute trash, absolute trash. Meanwhile, I was watching these other channels blow up because YouTube was kind of less about, oh, I'm gonna whip out my camera and make a shitty little video now, and more about production value and how do I make a slick looking video but still get my message and flavor out there. So eventually I hemmed and hawed and about a year, a little over a year ago, I learned how to use Adobe Premiere. Now, did my videos immediately look better after I used Premiere? Absolutely not. They looked way worse because I had absolutely no idea how to use the software, but I'd say after about four months of tediously, tediously learning how to use it, Eventually, I became proficient enough to actually make my videos look better than they did before. So, although I'm a Mac guy now, and although I use Final Cut and you know all the Mac software, I really kind of cut my teeth on Adobe Premiere, and I still look back on that time as like, wow, I actually learned how to edit. I actually learned how to make stuff look good. I learned all the powerful tools involved to be able to make a decent looking production video. And this is only a year before where I literally didn't know how to compose a shot, was using a cell phone camera, and coming out with some of the worst garbage you've ever seen. So I feel like that was uh, Adobe software. I have to thank you for really, really pushing me and thank you for not being user friendly. Thank you for being an absolute nightmare to use. But now that, but now that Adobe is the industry standard, I have that skill, I've acquired that skill. And although it doesn't really carry over to Final Cut so much, I still have that just in case I need to edit a video for someone or I do third party editing, which I do for money on the side. I can use that software if they need me to use it. So another good skill to have and another reason that you should stick with something until you can actually do it. Number four is spend time on it. Now, I would never, ever, ever have gotten rid of all the other you know, projects and endeavors that were paying the bills. And I wouldn't have quit my university job that was actually paying the bills you know, six months to a year ago if I didn't think that video was going to be successful or if I was getting better at it. If I thought, if I had any doubt in my mind that I wouldn't be able to bring home a paycheck to my family, I wouldn't be doing this full time now. But it does require a full time effort. And I truly believe that unless you're super, super amazing and you somehow manage to cut your workflow down, you know, less than half of the amount of time I put in, you're just way better and more organized than I am, more power to you. But I, I'm really jealous if you can actually pull that off because let me break it down. So between two channels, I film three episodes a week. Now, 
every time I go out and shoot an episode, it takes about three to five hours to actually film that episode. So for the entire week, if we add it all together, we're looking at about 15 hours of just shooting, just filming. That's not preparing ideas or scripting or anything like that. Depending on each episode, it usually takes about eight to 16 hours per episode for me to edit. So sometimes I'll have one day edit, so it's a full day of work, or sometimes I have two day edits, it's two days of work. But total, in total, I'd say it's about, on average, about 35 hours a week that I do of editing. So that's the biggest chunk. SEO, or search engine optimization, is probably one of the most important things in a, again, one of those things I neglected in the past, and that's tagging your video, doing proper descriptions, good thumbnails, going back to the videos that are not performing anymore, finding those, checking analytics, looking at your target demographics, finding all those graphs and seeing why they're not performing. Audience retention, are people clicking off of my videos? Good point. I used to have these awesome intros that I used to spend probably more time on them shooting and editing them than the actual content of the video. And although I thought they were really cool and a lot of people would leave comments, they would say, hey, these are absolutely beautiful. They give me real perspective on what's happening in the video and where you are. At the end of the day, when you check the actual viewer retention, you'll see that my viewer retention in the beginning would drop because they don't get to the content of the video fast enough. And for a casual viewer who doesn't know me or my channel or my family, they're like, what the hell is this? He's not talking about the topic. This is all a big waste of time. I'm not gonna care to uh, continue the video. So you can actually see that dip. Uh, the Food Ranger, a good friend of mine. A lot of you always ask me that I should do like a collab with him or something. He's a very, very busy man. And this guy, he literally taught me so much about SEO and how viewer retention works and all these analytics and stuff. And I kind of got bitten by the bug. So right now I usually spend about 10 hours a week on SEO. So going back, revamping these videos, making sure that they perform again, following trends. Oh, people are interested in this kind of topic now. How do I make my own brand of that topic? How do I bring this into my channel? So again, 10 hours a week just on SEO. And through SEO, all of these kind of like boring nitty gritty details that most people don't care about taught me a lot about marketing, how to be successful at you know, promoting your brand, getting on social media, posting reliably on other social media sources to build your brand there so that people go over to your YouTube, your YouTube channel. Patron, a huge thing. Wouldn't be able to do any of this without Patron, especially in the beginning because this core following of people that were you know, being so generous to me and my family, sending money because they support me, interacting with them, getting closer to the subscribers, and kind of breaking that barrier between the comments section and what actually gets produced. Because through Patreon, I had people sending me ideas. I can do polls. They, you know, they write back and forth and say, I'd really like you to cover this. All of these kind of tools in SEO that I do every week kind of morphed into the success of my channel. And it was a huge, huge part of the success. Every week, maybe I go to Shenzhen to see Winston because we have to do ADV or he comes to my city. That's in total with, tra with or without traffic. I'd say it's about six hours travel time. Not even gonna throw that in there. Scripting, I have to script every single video. Yes, if I'm walking around vlogging, maybe I didn't write so much of a script, but at least I have to get bullet points out there to be able to know what I'm gonna talk about. If it's a story, not so much because it's just recounting personal accounts, but for example, with this video, here's all of my bullet points that I've scripted. Now I didn't write down exactly what I'm gonna say, but what I did do was make sure that I cover every topic that I wanted to hit in this video, which improved my workflow in the editing process. So we're talking on average, for me, about 55 to 60 hours just on YouTube. And it's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of work. And it's also the most time consuming hobby turned into a job I've ever had in my life. So when people say like, oh, it must be so fun. I don't want to do so and so job because I want to be a YouTuber. Oh, I don't want to do so and so job. I want to make videos or you know, art or one of my own pieces of content. It's really a starving artist thing until you put together all the skills that go into it. Like I said, marketing, shooting a video, knowing how to use a camera, uh, planning out correct topics, following trends. All of these things, interaction with social media, all of these things kind of culminate into a successful YouTube channel and I'm just, just beginning, I'm just getting there. I know someday that I'm not going to live in China. I know that for a fact, but I do know that I will carry on the spirit of this channel, the attitude of this channel, the attitude of my family and what we do together throughout the world, wherever we may go. We're never gonna really slow down. I don't wanna end up as an old man with a crick in his neck telling stories with a glass of whiskey. Actually, that'll probably happen, won't it? Anyway, to be able to do this, and when I say do this, I mean do YouTube as a job and also something you love to do is an incredible challenge and I can safely say it's the most difficult thing that I've ever done. 
Now to be able to feed a family, because my wife's a stay-at-home wife, to be able to feed a family by making videos is scary. It's absolutely terrifying because if you don't stay on the ball and you don't put in twice the amount of work that you do for a normal 9 to 5 job, then you're going to flounder. You're not going to make it unless you're the most charismatic person in the entire world or you already have a massive following behind you. But to actually make this doable, to make it a career, is super, super challenging, but it's also the most rewarding thing I've ever done because number one, you guys, it's fantastic to be able to have such a community backing you and behind you that really, really enjoys your content, pushes you to continue doing it. So money becomes a non-issue at that point. If you're making enough to be able to support you and your family, then the next most important thing after you feed your family's mouths is the interaction with these subscribers. It's literally like having friends and a family behind. I'm talking to this weird mechanical camera kind of across from me, and then exporting my ideas across the world, and then getting feedback. It's a very, very amazing and rewarding and warm feeling. Also, I think that YouTube is definitely not a sustainable thing for a long-term career. A lot of people say, what are you gonna be some guy just teaching us about China for 20 years? You gotta grow up and get a new real job. It's obviously not, not my only thing that I pursue in life. It opens up to different opportunities. In 2017, media is definitely especially social media, the most important thing that you can get behind if you want to promote something that you want to create. I'm not the kind of guy that wants to have a boss. I want to be my own boss. But opportunities like Conquering Southern China, my TV show, which is just exploding all over the internet right now. Amazon Prime, going to be on Hulu, hopefully on Netflix. A lot of people loving it. Now we're filming the second season. We funded our Kickstarter successfully in like a week. I couldn't believe the response we had behind it because Winston and I especially are good at, we're getting good at what we're doing. I can safely say that. Yeah, maybe we have a ton more to learn, but we paired up with successful people that know what they're doing as well. Rick and Mark, our production team. All of these factors are opening up huge doors for me and my family and everything that I want to do in life. So it's not just down to YouTube. It's down to what YouTube and social media has brought, the community that it's gathered together. So Laudy6, maybe is not going to be the same thing as it was today, as it is five or 10 years from now, if it even exists then. But what I'm doing is going to revolve around this base that I've created through social media. So all in all, I wanna say thank you so much, Lowenders, and I will catch you on the next one.